Thank you for inviting me here. It's a very nice um, symposium, very nice gathering. And um, I think uh, even though it, it seems that uh, all these fields are somehow not so related, even if that may seem, but I listening to that, to, to these presentations, I found some similarities that I've tried to integrate in my presentation. So, um, on one hand, uh, it's nice to have presentation after Professor Popovich because he introduced in the beginning what I will try to do again. But uh, uh, I promise you I'll go in different directions then. So, so why, why robots at all? If I manage to start this, then of course I will be able to, yeah. Okay, so what we have here is an example of, of a person that uh, suffered some sort of infarction to the spinal cord, trying to walk in our rehabilitation center. And if you observe this walking, uh, there are all elements that are needed for walking there. So we have uh, some sort of anti-gravity support coming from these four-point crutches. We have movement, cyclical movements of the legs, which is uh, somehow impeded by uh, spasticity, as you can see. Uh, balance is managed also by these four-point crutches. And um, trying to get such a, such a difficult patient to walk is quite an endeavor for um, physical therapists. So this is one way how to approach uh, rehabilitation of such patient. Here we can see the same, this is the same subject walking on a treadmill, being uh, partially body weight supported. There are two therapists that are uh, lifting and manipulating the movement of the legs of the patient while the balance is uh, maintained by the person holding onto the uh, bars of the treadmill. And then if we put this patient in the locomat, which was introduced uh, on several occasions this day before, then we can see, uh, then we can get an idea why robotics is useful in clinical rehabilitation. But if we look uh, more closely at this walking, what we can observe is that this walking appears to be very much normal-like. And as it was pointed out by both Professor Popovich and Professor Molinari, uh, actually the machine is now walking the patient. So um, what do we have at the moment uh, on, on the market of the devi of devices, of the robotic devices for walking? And what is that what we don't have? If we uh, divide rehabilitation in, let's say, three phases, then the early phase is when you put the patient in a device like Locomat or device called Geo of RECA Technologies, where you essentially provide cyclical leg movement. And that's about it. The, partially, we can also talk about the weight shifting. Then uh, the patients can, well, af after uh, uh, mastering or after receiving enough therapy in these devices, they can move over ground to devices like Andago of Hokoma, um, 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 uh, Ego of Medica. This is a device that, that uh, has been developed at our institute and then commercialized and Kinia Assist. Then we can practice also some other aspects of walking. Um, and later on, there are some devices where patients can focus, they can, they can move unassisted, they can move their legs in an unassisted way, and they are then faced with some sort of challenges that resemble uh, uh, some challenges that, are, that they will be facing in their uh, community walking. So some sort of proactive uh, um, balancing, avoiding of obstacles and things like that. So um, what is missing then? And which way, uh, what is the way to go on or what is the, uh, the missing component of, of the puzzle which will fit nicely into the uh, therapeutic aspects of the rehabilitation robots. So cyclical leg movements and the weight shifting capabilities are adequately covered. 
what, what in my view has not been covered so far is something which is related to the dynamic balancing capabilities and all the things that come to, with this. So uh, what we experience in our everyday life are some sort of perturbations during walking. Either there is a slippery surface, either there are uh, 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 people in the crowd in the shopping malls, things like that. And uh, patients, even after they finish rehabilitation, even after they're considered to be rehabilitated, even if they have, let's say, functional ambulation category of five, meaning that they are somehow perfectly rehabilitated, they still have a lot of difficulties with this particular uh, um, aspect of their walking. And dynamic balancing and coordination uh, of movement is something which is, which is quite challenging. So if we look at the balancing in, in bipeds, um, then one thing is that dynamic balancing is something which appears very natural. If, if you observe an uh, uh, intact people, person walking, this is something that the, the balancing effort will not even be noticed. But um, if we look at what it takes to maintain dynamic balance during walking, then we can talk about uh, different strategies that are used uh, by humans uh, to recover or to face sudden perturbations. Uh, one strategy is called in-place strategy, consisting of ankle and hip strategies, or in, uh, also inertia strategies. This is something which is quite fast in action, and it lasts on the leg that is currently in the stance phase. And then the stepping strategy, which actually means that a person walking when faced to unexpected perturbation in the next step uh, places the foot at the appropriate location. Um, I, now move, I will now move to the balance after stroke because the stroke being the largest population that is in need of efficient rehabilitation is that um, if we look about, if we, take, if we think about the, the different um, impairments or, or difficulties that post-stroke subjects face after the rehabilitation, there is pronounced asymmetry in weight bearing uh, um, and the spatial temporal parameters are also quite asymmetric. Sphinx, um, at the impaired side, uh, at the impaired side is slow and there are poor balancing uh, abilities. And uh, our approach to address these issues actually started uh, many years ago with different uh, devices. Uh, first, very simple device for dynamic balancing during standing, then the mentioned ego device, and this is the uh, device we call the balance assessment robot. And this is a device actually designed for, we, we can classify this device as being an exoskeleton and the part of the skeleton that is this device is exoing his pelvis. So the walking person is in contact with this six degree of freedom robot uh, with quite uh, a stiff connection to the robot. This is haptic device. Um, and as you can see, this particular, uh, uh, this particular device is aimed for training walking on the, on the floor, and it can apply uh, perturbing pushes, but also these perturbing pushes can be then used for uh, evoking different kind of responses during walking. The problem with the overground devices is that you would need uh, like a airplane hangar of adequate square footage that you could practice different uh, aspects of walking. That's why we uh, built another um, replica of this device which is put on the uh, treadmill and can do similar things. And here what is shown is also the vertical actuation, the vertical haptical degrees of freedom. So now we ended up with a device actually which, which actuates five degrees of freedom in a haptical way, uh, enabling different experimental paradigms, different training paradigms during walking. So um, what I will present mostly today is the ongoing work 
to that spans through several research projects, the one being Balance that already finished. And I will talk about three high-functioning post-stroke subjects that already completed rehabilitation at our institution prior to enrollment in this um, experimental program. They all had functional ambulation category five, and we uh, focused on three distinct uh, training paradigms. First was symmetry walking, then symmetry training, push-off training, and perturbed balance training. The underlying approach that we think is um, uh, novel is that actually what we would like to do here is to implement what the therapists do in their daily work. And if you observe a therapist walking alongside the patient over ground or on the treadmill, what they actually do is when they're uh, addressing uh, their, their insufficient weight bearing on the impaired side, they gently push subject to that impaired side when entering the stance phase. So this is the underlying approach, push-like assistive or perturbing forces that are applied at appropriate time instance within the gait cycle, which depends on particular feature of walking that we would like to address. So here in the, this video, we will show all three patients, each doing different things. This first patient, um, is actually is training symmetry during walking. We can see that um, this, uh, this treadmill here is instrumented treadmill, which means that we are able in real time to extract different spatiotemporal gait events. So we can provide uh, also real time feedback on the performance of the patient. So here we can show, for example, the duration of the left stance, duration of the right stance, length of the left and right step, and so on. This is another patient. As you can see, they are all quite capable of walking, but you can also see that there are some deficiencies in their walking. Here, this, this uh, part of the video will illustrate the perturbed walking training. Here, at different, so unexpectedly, at different uh, phases of base, gait cycle, uh, there occurs a perturbation in direction which is unknown to the, to the walking subject. And then, of course, you can play with different parameters like amplitude of perturbation, duration of perturbation, to elicit such, such perturbing event which is in capacity of the subject to overcome and then hopefully also to master after sufficient number of repetitions. Um, here with, with these patients, what we were able to achieve at the beginning, they were capable of walking like 15, 20 minutes per session. At the end, there, there were uh, 30 sessions that spent over three months of training. They were able to walk for like an hour in each training session. So in, um, in, in duration of walking that lasts for an hour, they were capable of performing more than 1,000 steps, being either perturbed or training the symmetry or push off. So this number of steps is very difficult to achieve in, in any kind of, uh, so in training with the therapists. And also, as you can see, the variability of this walking is much different than the variability in the uh, devices which are intended for movement of the legs of the patients. So here we have the third patient who is also doing the symmetry training and then the perturbation training. So if you look now a little bit uh, the, the underlying philosophy or the approach. So um, what with this device we can do is like mentioned before, we will apply different force impulses of different duration depending on what, what the objectives are. So, and also that depends on the particular deficiency of a particular patient. There may be different approaches that will work in one patient, but in other pa patients it will not work. So this is something that need, needs to be tried and tested. So here, for example, if this, all these patients were right-sided mm -hmm. hemiparetic patients, when they entered the stance phase, there was a gentle push to the right 
which, which in, in a way um, persuaded them or forced them to spend more time on their impaired side. Uh, another approach that worked in uh, some patients was that, uh, um, or to the, the approach which worked for uh, assistance in swing of the hemiparetic leg was that when the patient entered the stance on the left side, there was a brief impulse of torque in the counterclockwise direction, which helped in swinging the left, the leg forward. So if you look uh, in the first patient, what was the situation at the very first session when the training started? So we can observe here clear asymmetry in weight-bearing capabilities, which is also which can also be seen on the screen. The right bar on the right side is substantially shorter than the bar on the left side. And so now, one so one approach is to provide patient with a cognitive feedback in terms of visual feedback. And another is to apply these pushes to the right side, which, which uh, forces the patient to spend more time on the right side. And this is now the, after 30 sessions of training. And uh, it can be seen that the walking is much more fluent. And also the symmetry of weight bearing is substantially improved. So if we now look at uh, some of the data that can be gathered with this machine is, so this is the, the situation before training, this is the situation after training. So if we look at this uh, very uh, characteristic butterfly diagrams, this is the center of mass, this is the center of pressure. Before training, you could, you could see that there was a, a quite big tendency of uh, having center of mass more to the left side, which is now improved. And also, if we look at the duration on the left side and on the right side, there is a much bigger difference after the training. The push of training uh, is there are also several aspects of how one can uh, train this aspect. So, uh, one possibility is if we talk about the impaired uh, push off at the right side, when entering the stance on the left side, there is a push of the device backward <coughs> and downward. But in this case, uh, several patients have shown us that this can be quite nicely mitigated by actually yielding to that perturbation and uh, avoiding uh, uh, this push-off and then to catch on uh, with the, again in the, ne in, in the next uh, cycle with the left leg. So another possibility again is us with the uh, symmetry training uh, when pushing to the right, there is a uh, when you push person uh, to the side, it also means that the treadmill will uh, drag the leg more backward, which will necessitate this push-up. So here is the, uh, the result that we compared the first session and the 30th session. The ankle power, for example, this is, this is, uh, these graphs show a situation on the right side. So before training, there was quite small power of burst in ankle plantar flexors, which was uh, quite nicely improved later. And um, the last uh, training regime, perturbed balance training, uh, so again, this, all these patients uh, completed around 30 training sessions. Uh, the perturbations were applied in different directions of different magnitudes. Um, um, but also with varying the, um, the gait speed. And if we look um, an example of, of the um, responses after perturbations that occurred when entering left stance to the left side, this is actually for all these patients, for all three patients, this, there was, that was the most demanding <coughs> perturbation because that actually uh, necessitates uh, making cross step. So, um, as we can see that before training, the, this patient uh, addressed this perturbation in such a way that he pivoted uh, the stance leg, while we cannot see uh, 
no stepping response. Well, after the training, you can see a, a quite, quite nicely, nicely modulated stepping response. And if we compare to the control subject, uh, this uh, capacity of, of mitigating this perturbation is quite similar, even though there are also, of course, uh, certain differences, like uh, this particular patient was not capable of performing uh, um, the hip response. Uh, this is also, that can also be seen in the EMG responses. Here we have the left leg and the right leg, again, before, after, and the control. And you, we can see that the left unimpaired side, if we look at the modulation of the EMGs, is quite similar uh, in patient and in the control subject. But if we look at the perturbation that, uh, that is uh, commencing when entering the stance phase on the right side and to the right, then we can see quite pronounced uh, difference in the strategies. So here we have uh, with, the, with the control subject, the healthy subject, we can see similar performances before. While with, the, with this particular post-stroke subject, we can see that the stepping response with the healthy left leg <coughs> was the main strategy to counteract, counteract this perturbation. And if we look at the, the EMGs, then again, with the healthy control subject, we see quite nice response and modulation of the majority of the lower limb muscles. While with this particular uh, stroke <coughs> subject, that was not the case neither before nor after the perturbation. Even though we could observe that uh, there were some changes in the, in the, um, in the motor control program, so if you look, the all three patients, the way how they behaved after the training, when we uh, changed, when we were changing different amplitudes of perturbations, then we can observe that on the left, let's say left sound side, we have this uh, hip response, which is characteristic also for the healthy individuals, while on the right side, we don't have this particular response and with this particular patient one we can also observe that his main strategy to counteract these perturbations was to adapt quite wide stance during walking. In the second patient what we can see when uh, looking at the perturbations uh, on to the left left and to the right right we can see that he was after the 30th session he was uh, quite capable so there was this nice hip response on the right side, there is also a little bit of hip response kicking in after the training. And also we can see quite nice ability of uh, using uh, nicely graded stepping responses um, depending on the amplitude of the perturbation. And this is the third patient, the one that we took, had a look before in more details. So we see on the left side quite normal-like response and on the right side exaggerated stepping response. So um, the, the experience that we gained so far uh, with, the, with the patients that uh, underwent this program is that the outward perturbations in the frontal plane, which are the most challenging and actually that, that in most case, cases um, result in fall, the, the, before training the patients have shown reluctance or inability to make the cross step which is necessary to counteract perturbations of, of a higher magnitude. Um, there, is also, there was also absence of instep, ankle and hip responses when the perturbation was delivered on the impaired right leg. And also prior to perturbation, again, re let me remind you that these patients had functional ambulation category of five they were capable of uh, successfully negotiating perturbations up to 8% of body weight, which is not sufficient for, let's say, functional responses in everyday life. <coughs> After the training, uh, we see that the strategies remained uh, quite similar, but uh, the, what, what we achieved is that the perturbation, perturbation amplitudes that the persons can uh, successfully negotiate, increased to 13% of body weight, which is quite uh, substantial. And uh, we may say that this, uh, so this, this is also quite functional for their everyday activity. Um, 
in that sense, the, this perturbation balance training seems feasible and quite efficient. Then what we did is that we, with this patient three, where I said that uh, uh, there were like modest improvements showing that there is some sort of reorganization of motor program, we continued the program. So after the 30 sessions of training, we did another 30 sessions of training, but now this was more specific to, to his particular deficiency. And that deficiency was that he was still not able to hold weight on the impaired side for longer duration of time. So now the training was mostly uh, targeted in this 30th, the, the, the next 30 sessions, uh, we specifically targeted perturbations that occur on the right leg to the right side. And this was done with lower amplitudes but with longer duration. And here are the results of the training. So this is the, this is the stepping strategy used before and no hip strategy. Uh, um, and then after the training, what we can see that the, the stepping strategy was reduced quite considerably and there's kicking in also the hip strategy. And if we look at the EMGs, so before I mentioned that there was no modulation of the activities gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, while after the training, there is a clear, uh, you, we clearly measured that there is activity in these muscles which underlie the biomechanical effects shown on the previous slides. And this, these um, responses are quite similar to the responses of the healthy control subject. So, in order to conclude uh, this particular approach that is directed to training of dynamic balancing and movement coordination, um, what, what we <coughs> somehow found out is that the training needs to be quite specific in terms of what particular patient or subject needs. It needs to be targeted to different uh, deficiency in the gait cycle related either to loading response, load bearing symmetry, push off. Then we need to pinpoint what are the main difficulties in dynamic balancing that uh, precludes subject to do, uh, to efficiently uh, counteract, counteract perturbations. What also was found quite, um, quite important was that the speed of walking uh, where we do, where we perform this kind of training needs to be sufficiently slow, even though this, we, we may know that uh, walking at slow uh, um, speeds is far more challenging than walking with higher speeds. But if we want to train this kind of uh, um, um, abilities at higher speeds, then you would not be able to concentrate on what is important. Feedback on the performance during training is absolutely uh, uh, necessary. And it, it appears from this limited uh, um, experience so far with this limited number of patients is that much long, larger number of training sessions is needed. And also all these, all three patients, like I like said, they finished their, their um, um, rehabilitation, so they were, m uh, before entering this um, program, they were all like six or more months after the, the lesion. Uh, it seems that the continuation of this training after formal conclusion of rehabilitation is still quite important. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr.